we're back on the adventure of the Bible. In Genesis 3.15, you have the first direct prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ, the promised seed. That's the theme of the book of Genesis, by the way, is the promised seed. And this is one of the most important verses in the entire Bible. So you've probably already heard me go over and over it, but Genesis 3, 14 and 15 says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Notice he told the serpent, It shall bruise thy head. So the rest of the Bible you'll find the serpent attacking the seed because he knows that the seed's going to bruise his head. And the Lord Jesus Christ constantly taunts the devil by smacking him upside the head. And that's what I want to talk about is we're going to go on this adventure of the Bible with the tour God being the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And he's going to show us all of his knockout punches to Lucy and his henchmen. So me and you are no match for Lucifer. We aren't even a match for his henchmen. But inside of us is where the Lord lives and through him we can get the victory. So this will be titled, Don't Lose Your Head. You know, the Bible is full of common, ordinary sayings that me and you use every day, like, don't lose your head. And that's what all my points are going to be titled, is using these common sayings about the head that people use every day. The first one I want to look at is, she really hit the nail on the head. You ever heard somebody say that? They're like, man, she really hit the nail on the head with that one. Well, that common saying comes from the Bible. In Judges 5, 24 through 27, it says, Blessed above women shall Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite be. Blessed shall she be above women in the tent. This woman, Jael, she um, actually takes a tent peg and a hammer and hammers it through a man by the name of Sisera. She hammers it through his temples. He is a type of the Antichrist, and he thought he, he was going to run in there into her tent for safety, but he didn't realize she was for the Lord and not for him. And it says in verse 25, he asked water and she gave him milk. She brought forth butter and a lordly dish. She put her hand to the nail and her right hand to the workman's hammer. And with the hammer, she smote Sisera. She smote off his head when she had pierced and stricken through his temples. At her feet, he bowed, he fell, he lay down. At her feet, he bowed, he fell. Where he bowed there, he fell down dead. You see, Jael, the woman, pictures the bride of Christ bruising Satan. I think the Lord had a woman do it for a reason. Sisera is a type of the Antichrist himself. And in Romans 16, 20, it says, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So, me and you are the bride, right? As, a, the, as the body of Christ, all born-again believers, we make up the bride of Christ, the woman that's going to marry the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to let us bruise Satan under our feet shortly. Well, that's the picture. You got jail, a woman, picturing the bride of Christ, bruising Satan atop of the Antichrist. Also, take into consideration, she smote off his head with a nail and a workman's hammer. The Word of God is likened to nails and a hammer. Ecclesiastes 12, 11, The words of the wise are as goads, and as nails fastened by the master of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. So the words are like goads and like nails 
But remember in Jeremiah 23, 29, what else is it like? He says, is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. So the words like nails, the words like a hammer, and since we are a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, and Jael used a workman's hammer, you see the picture coming together quite perfectly. The workman's hammer will hit the nail on the head every time. And the devil's only weakness is the living word and the written word. And when you quote the book, you nailed him. You nailed him. So she really hit the nail on the head. Well, let me tell you, number two, this guy, this other guy, he's got rocks for brains. You got another devilish henchman of Lucy himself named Abimelech. He's a wicked man. And he pictures the Antichrist. This man, Abimelech, killed his own brothers his own half brothers his life has a similar fate to that of sisera because he gets his brains bashed in and judges 9 53 through 54 it says in a certain woman notice that a certain woman cast a piece of a millstone upon abimelech's head and all to break his skull then he called hastily unto the young man his armor bearer and said unto him, Draw thy sword and slay me, that men say not of me. A woman slew him. And his young man thrust him through and he died. It's significant once again that it is a woman who puts a hurting on the head of the devil's man. Picturing the Lord letting us bruise the head of the serpent and then finishing, and then he's going to finish him off himself. But Abimelech had rocks for brains and he got rocked. Our rock is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he can either be a rock of safety to you. Or he can be a stone cut without hands that will smite you to pieces. To Abimelech, he was a stone that smite him to pieces. Yeah, he had rocks for brains, this guy. And he got rocked. And then you got another guy. Another guy... The common saying for this guy is, off with his head. Because his head came off. Over there in 1 Samuel 5, the Philistines had taken the Ark of the Covenant and put it in the house of their god, Dagon. This was a big no-no. You couldn't just take the Ark of the Covenant like that, which represents the presence of God, and put it in your house of your god. And it's quite comical what the Lord does to feeble old Dagon. In 1 Samuel 5, 3, it says, And when they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord, and they took Dagon and set him in his place again. Imagine if your God was so feeble, you had to pick him up and put him back in his place. But the Lord caused Dagon to do a face plant. He made him lick the dust. This is a good picture of how when you get the Lord in your house, he'll help you get rid of your false gods. They brought, they brought the presence of the Lord into the house of Dagon, their God, and he was killing Dagon. In 1 Samuel 5, 4, when they arose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold, only the stump of Dagon was left to him. He got his head cut off. And when Jesus Christ shows up, he cuts down the gods. He cuts down the God-haters. He'll cut down the Antichrist and the workers of iniquity. It's like a big, burly, giant man going through the forest and cutting down the trees and leaving just the stumps of Dagon. Got his palms and his head cut off. That's brutal. So remember that before you get the big head. There's our next common saying, get the big head. You know, a lot of people do that. Saul was like a, a whole head above everybody in Israel. And I believe the common saying is head and shoulders above everybody else. That's what he was. In 1 Samuel 9, 2, it says, And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man, and a goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. 
from his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. This was a big dude. Bigger than everybody. Not as big as Goliath. But he was a big guy. First Samuel fifteen seventeen, And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. You see, Saul was a big man, but at one time he was little in his own sight. But then he got the big head. You see, we're nothing. We're like little ants. We're small and feeble. And when Saul saw himself as little, he was a good guy. When he got the big head, he became a type of the Antichrist. Look what happens to him. Look at his fate in 1 Samuel 31, 8 through 9. And it came to pass on the morrow when the Philistines came to strip the slain that they found Saul and his three sons fallen in Mount Gilboa, and they cut off his head and stripped off his armor and sent into the land of the Philistines round about to publish it in the house of their idols and among the people. Off with Saul's head, they said. He got the big head. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. And you know what? This pictures what the devil would like to do to you. The devil would love to cause you to lose your head out of frustration and lose your testimony and then strip you of your whole armor of God. Just like they cut off his head and stripped him of his armor. The devil would love to do that to you. And then as the accuser of the brethren, he would go publish it and all the house of the idols, among the people, on Facebook, in the newspaper, in the church, and everywhere else. He loves a fallen soldier, just like the Philistines loved Saul laying on the ground so much they cut off his head, stripped his armor, sent it to the land of the Philistines round about, and published it in the house of their idols and among the people. It was, it was just a great thing for them because the hatred they had. But there's another one. Another common saying was, it got in his head. You ever had something and it, it just gets in your head and you can't, you can't get it out? It eats you up? Well, there was this giant, everybody knows him, named Goliath, and he presented himself to Israel for 40 days, right? He was the reigning champion in Gath. He was killing the competition. Nobody wanted to get in the ring with him. Not even Saul and his big head. As big as Saul's head was, he didn't even want none of Goliath. And with that big head, um, the big head of Saul, it was able for Goliath's mockery to just get lost in there with all that room. And with all that room in your big head, it's easy to give place to the devil, you see. You know, other than our little stripling, stripling as it calls him named David, David didn't let the giant's trash talk get into his head. Instead, he got into Goliath's head. In 1 Samuel 17, 49, it says, And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So the stone actually sunk into Goliath's forehead. I like David's little shepherd bag. He just takes his bag, pulls a stone out, slings it right at Goliath. So he's got a little shepherd's bag. You know, I got a lunch box, and I don't even put lunch in it. I just have my Bibles in it that I carry to work. I carry my Bible everywhere I go. That's my shepherd's bag full of stones. I can't take on the devil's man. I can't take on the devil. I have to pull a word out of the shepherd's bag. And that's what will get to their head. You know, you got to be like Michael the archangel. You just got to say, the Lord rebuke thee. Well, that's the scriptures. You quote the scriptures, that's the Lord rebuking the temptation. That's the Lord rebuking the flesh. That's the Lord rebuking the unclean spirits and the devil. But Goliath falls flat on his face. And this is why you should never be a showboat or brag. Or act like you're something when you're nothing because you're just deceiving yourself. You see, Goliath thought he was unbeatable. And he was high-minded mentally and physically. But it turns out, compared to God, he was small 
and feeble. Compared to the Most High, he was itsy, bitsy, teeny, weeny, and stinky. Can you imagine how much he stunk out there in the heat? Smelling like Lazarus after he was dead for four days. But he thought he was something. He was nothing. Galatians 6, 3, for if a man think himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. He deceiveth himself. In 1 Samuel 17, 50, So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. No sword because Saul, who was like a Greekifying, Bible-correcting, NIV-using pastor, had taken away everybody's sword. But David had enough of the word in his heart to where... He was bold in the Lord. In 1 Samuel 51, 7, 1 Samuel 17, 51, Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. He stood on him, took his sword and cut his head off. That's how I used to see my papa kill those snakes in the backyard with a shovel. Smash it on its head, then wiggle it around. That's how you kill the serpent. You cut the head off. You know, everything reminds me of the Lord beating the devil up for some reason. Sometimes when the devil bothers me, I sneak some of my kids' gummy worms, and I just bite its head off and say, The Lord rebuked the old Satan. When I see my kids eating them gummy worms, that's what I think about. The Lord biting the head off of that serpent and spitting it out. When I finally get my mower to start, when the grass starts growing and I'm mowing the yard, that reminds me of the second coming. I think about the Lord and it reminds me he's coming back like a threshing machine and he's just mowing everybody down. You know, once you start figuring out the Bible and... You start reading about the second coming all the time. It's like everything reminds you of it. But here's another common saying. He hung his head. You ever heard somebody say he hung his head? Paul talks about instructing those that oppose themselves. Some people oppose themselves. They're working against their own self. It's like they're beating their self up. It's like they're punching their self in the face. They think that they're really doing good, but they're actually just hanging their own noose. They're actually just hanging their own head on the gallows. And that's just like Haman. This guy named Haman, he wanted to hang the Jews, but he ended up, as they say, getting it in the neck. In Esther 9, 24 and 25, it says, Because Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, had devised against the Jews to destroy them and had cast pur, that is, the lot, to consume them and to destroy them. And when Esther came before the king, he commanded by letters that his wicked device, which he devised against the Jews, should return upon his own head, and that he and his sons should be hanged on the gallows. You see the picture? Haman, a type of the Antichrist, a man who hates the Jews, just like the Antichrist is going to hate the Jews, but the Antichrist ends up getting killed by the king of the Jews. Haman gets killed. He gets hung after he wanted to hang the Jews. You see the picture? All this wicked stuff people are doing against people, they're just hanging their own head when they do it. They're building their own electric chair. In Proverbs 1.18 it says, And they lay wait for their own blood. They're laying wait for somebody else's blood, but they're really laying wait for their own blood as well. You might as well hang your head in the sense that you're bowing down to the Almighty. You're humbling yourself, giving it to God, because you don't want to be like Haman. He literally hung his head. He laid wait for his own blood. Now, here's another one. You ever heard of the saying, a skull fracture where there was well there is a skull fracture at Golgotha 
In Mark 15, 22, it says, And they bring him into the place of Golgotha, which is, being interpreted, the place of a skull. In John 19, 17, it says, And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew, Golgotha. So they, this is where the Lord was crucified. And they say Golgotha, where Jesus was crucified, is shaped like a skull. So when the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ penetrated the ground at Golgotha, it foreshadowed the bruising of the head of the serpent. The serpent got his skull fractured there. They also say Goliath's head would have been buried in there, which paints the picture even clearer. Goliath getting another head wound. You know, they mocked Jesus Christ on the cross. They said, Save thyself if thou be the Son of God. Come down from the cross. But the Lord was in victory. He was triumphing over them. He spoiled principalities and powers, making a show of them openly. When they took that cross and rammed it into that place of the skull, it pictured the serpent getting his head bruised. He got a skull fracture. And the Lord didn't let these words they were saying get in his head. He was actually spoiling the principalities and powers getting in their head. In Isaiah 50 and verse 8, it lets you know a little bit of what they were saying to him, what he was saying to him. He says, Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is mine adversary? Let him come near to me. You know, he's on the cross and he's suffering and pain and agony, but in the spirit world, He's mowing them down. Now another one. You got the head wound. The head wound of the beast. In Revelation 13, 1 through 3. It says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Now seven heads, the Lord's just going to be like, that's more target practice for me. Seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. So, the Antichrist here, he gets a deadly head wound, but then he comes back from the dead to counterfeit the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. But you see it over and over again. The devil's man gets smacked in the head. And the people in the tribulation time period, they let the Antichrist get to their head literally. In Revelation 13, 16, it says, And he calls it all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. They let the Antichrist get to their head. They let that strong delusion get the best of them. Sometimes with your sin, you start feeling, here's your next common phrase, in over your head. In Psalm 38, 4, it says, For my iniquities are gone over mine head. As a heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. In Psalm 40, 12 through 13, it says, For an innumerable evils have come past me about. Mine iniquities have taken hold upon me, so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of mine head. Therefore, my heart faileth me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me, O Lord. Make haste to help me. When you're in over your head with sin, the only way out is through the Lord. Things down here can only help you so much. You have to get saved if you're not already. Then if you are over your head in sin as a saved person, then you need to confess your sins for restored fellowship. And it'll give you something to replace your sinful lifestyle with. You need to be separated unto something. Every time you get rid of a sin, you need to replace it with something else. And if you just stay in your sin, you're going to be this next common saying, sick in the head. You know, some people let their sin fester in their mind, 
and life until they literally become sick in the head. And Isaiah 1, 5, it says, Why should you be stricken anymore? You will rev revolt more and more. The whole head is sick. And the whole heart faint. You need to keep your head above water. You know the common saying? We're just trying to keep our head above water. That's what you need to do. Like Jonah. You know how Jonah did it? You know how he got his head back above the water? He prayed. All through Jonah 2. He was praying. He had them weed, weeds wrapped about his head. In Jonah 2, 5. But the Lord heard him and brought him back to the dry land. Got his head back above water. But... I'm going to leave it. I'm going to leave you with this here. There are things worth losing your head over. You're going to have to keep a good head on your shoulders, as they say, if you're ever going to lose your head over something good. John the Baptist, for example, he lost his head over something good. He lost his head over something that was worth losing his losing it over. And Matthew 14, 1 through 12 you know the story. It says in Matthew 14, 9, And the king was sorry, nevertheless for the oath's sake, and them which sat with him at meat, he commanded it to be given her, and he sent and beheaded John in the prison, and his head was brought in a charger and given to the damsel, and she brought it to her mother, and his disciples came and took up the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. John got beheaded for being a preacher of righteousness, for just for preaching the kingdom of heaven. He got beheaded for going and looking at Herod and saying it's not lawful for thee to have her. And it caused Herod's wife to hate him so much that she desired the head of John the Baptist. And he got his head off, cut off. He lost his head over something good. In Revelation 20 and verse 4, John says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. You see that? They didn't let the Antichrist get to their head. So they lost it for a good reason. They were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. If you're going to lose your head, it might as well be over something for the Lord Jesus Christ. They, they lost their head down here, but they got a new one over there. A, a lot better head. How about losing your head? for other Christians, your brothers and sisters in the Lord. It says in Romans 16, 3, 3, 4, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. They really stuck their neck out for him. Uh, do you ever do that? Do you ever lose your head for somebody else? In Galatians 4.15, Paul says, Where is then the blessedness you spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. They would have stuck their neck out, plucked out their own eyes, and lost their head for the Apostle Paul. Will you lose your head for the Lord Jesus Christ, or will you just lose your head for all the wicked stuff down here on this world there are some things worth losing your head over not sin don't lose your head over sin lose your head over the things of God 